if you if you change the incentives, if you change how much money you get to keep, people certainly change their behaviour. This is all very secretive and uh, it's it's problematic that, you know, you find out about it from a Daily Mail article. <laughs> There's actually an increasing body of evidence that will support this claim. Welcome to the Aussie Wire News. Today, we begin with some good news. Victoria Police have finally, after wasting two years of prosecutors' time and taxpayers' money, not to mention my time and money, dropped their criminal incitement charges against me. Actually, the charges were doubly criminal. They were, well, the charges were criminal, and the charges were criminal. It's pure coincidence, of course, that I was arrested a week after I announced that I was going to make Battleground Melbourne, a documentary starring Daniel Andrews as the villain, and then that the charges were dropped on the very next court date after Daniel Andrews resigned. There's nothing to see here, move along. We know thanks to Marty Fokker catching the Victoria Police on a hot mic during one of his arrests that they deliberately and cynically used charges for the purpose of imposing bail conditions and denying people their human right to engage in peaceful protest. Now, they admitted on that hot mic that the charges wouldn't stick, but that wasn't the point. The point was that they could abuse the process to get the effect they wanted, even though they knew that it was not legally or morally justified. There's an old phrase. The process is the punishment, and that is certainly true when they pursue you for two years in court, only to drop the charges when the political winds change and they fear that they won't win. But, as nice as it is to have the charges withdrawn, it doesn't feel like a win to me. I'll be getting my lawyer's invoice soon, and hmm, let's just say I'm not looking forward to that day. And of course, having these charges withdrawn doesn't give me back two years of worry, nor does it undo the human rights abuses of police showing up to my home for the purpose of intimidating me and ultimately arresting me. And of course, by withdrawing the charges, they remove any possibility that they might lose, that I might set some sort of a precedent against their disgraceful actions during COVID. I'm considering my options going forward, and I won't make any decisions about my next steps until next year. But if Victoria Police think that they're going to get away with this scot-free, they might need to think again. In the meantime, all Victoria Police actually achieved was guaranteeing that my crowdfunder for the Battleground Melbourne documentary was successful, and they gave me real street cred in the Battle of Ideas. Thank you for that. My next contribution to that Battle of Ideas is my book, Good People Break Bad Laws, which is available for pre-order now. And if you order now, you'll have a signed copy in time for Christmas. And in the process, you'll be helping me out when my lawyer's bill arrives. Use the code TAW, that's T-A-W, for a discount. With all of that said, it is still some good news to start today's episode of the Aussie Wire News. Well, news broke just a few days ago of something very odd happening in Victoria, and I know there's potentially a very long list depending on what you choose to look at, but the thing I'm talking about in particular was an article from the Daily Mail that caught my eye to do with land acquisition for the purposes of handing back to Indigenous corporations. And as best as I could tell, it was already well underway, and up until that moment in time, I'd heard nothing about it. So I reached out to somebody who I hoped would be able to shed some light on it, and uh, that is none other than MP or MLC David Limbrick, excuse me, fat fingers there. How are you, David, welcome back to the Aussie Wire. Oh, I'm great, thanks. Uh, glad to be back. Now, this this strikes me as a pretty big deal. There is an enormous amount of land, thousands of hectares of land are now being, uh, some of it is already public land, but a significant proportion is actually privately held land that the Victorian government plans and in some cases has already compulsorily acquired for the purpose of handing over to Indigenous corporations for management. Had you heard anything about this until the news broke recently? Not in this particular case, no. Uh, look, there's a, there's a lot of concerns here. Firstly, we've got the issue around compulsory acquisition. Um, you know, that's an infringement on property rights for a start. But secondly, you know, how much is that going to cost? Mm. Uh, the, you know, the taxpayers paying for this, of course. And then we've got the other issue of like, how's this all been happening? There's no parliamentary scrutiny on what's going on here. It hasn't. There's been no bills through Parliament that I'm aware of that have allowed this. Mm. And um, this is sort of happening before the treaty process that they've been talking about. This is mm. what's happening right now. And there's there's lots and lots of questions here. I mean, we've already got the uh, Parks Victoria and the EPA that are meant to be uh, managing these park lands. Um, why, why is it that we've got traditional owner corporations? Uh, are they going to be doing it better mm. somehow? Like, mm. um, pay for that. There's a lot of questions here. 
So the, the article itself, this is the one that caught my eye initially. Now, return to traditional owners, that sounds all, all very well and good, um, but it is a relatively modern phenomenon that we're seeing come to the fore now. Uh, prior to the Mabo decision, which happened when I was a young boy, that really was a, quite a novel concept. And then things seemed to settle down for a while. Where the Mabo decision was made, native title was granted over certain amounts of land. We've seen a dramatic rise recently. There's news coming out of Sydney of native title claims being made to prime real estate, you know, waterfront uh, real estate worth millions of dollars up in Sydney. We're now seeing the big Victorian government actively working to hand back some land here. We've seen you know, other things, and each of these issues is a separate issue, but they, to me they carry a theme. Climbers being locked out of the Grampians and told that they can no longer climb there when they've been they've had access for a long time. That's part of a trend, four-wheel drivers and hunters and cattle managers being locked out of out of land. What, 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 what's being achieved here? What is the government, in this case the Victorian government, actually trying to accomplish here? Do we know? We can only speculate, but I think what they're doing is preparing a lot of these things for their treaty negotiations that they've been talking about and trying to set up for a long time. I mm. think a lot of it's got to do with that. Um, yeah, we've seen a lot of access to different uh, public lands being shut down or or restricted in, in many ways. Uh, and the thing with this treaty process is it's not, it's not like one single treaty or one agreement what the government said is that there's going to be many, many treaties that mm. will happen over a very, very long time, apparently. Uh, and if we look at what's happening in Canada, that's been going on for decades mm. in their treaty process, and it's still going. Um, we have to question, really, uh, what what's the impact on property rights? Because property rights is fundamental here. It's fundamental to the stability in, in a free democracy. Mm. And if property rights are being eroded, uh, through these challenges and through compulsory acquisitions, then um, that causes lots of instability. Like it's my understanding that some of this land that was that's being acquired was actually flagged for uh, residential development. Does yes, that mean that we're not going to get houses built that were mm -hmm. going to be otherwise built? Are they going to turn that into parkland now? Mm -hmm. um, so what's happened? And with the people that bought that and intended to turn it into houses. Um, what about their plans for the future? Uh, you know, we have to, if we're going to think about equality under law, mm. then all of these things have to be weighed against each other. Mm. Now, you're absolutely right. Some of it certainly was um, zoned as urban growth zone, which means it's not residential yet, but it will be pretty soon. Uh, this is confirmation here again from the Daily Mail article. Uh, work has already begun on handing back the land after the Department of Energy, Environment and Climate Action compulsorily acquired a 39 hectare site in Epping. Now, you raised the concerns around property rights. I want to raise some concerns that I have around value for the taxpayer. Compulsory acquisition, in a lot of cases, they, they try and lowball and they strong arm and they use the weight of government to try and uh, essentially not pay people a fair price for their land. And inevitably, certainly when you're talking about larger parcels of land that are worth large amounts of money, that leads to enormous amounts of litigation. And I'm, I'm, I'm aware of one specific case where I know some of the parties involved, years of litigation costing millions of dollars, and then eventually the government actually then had to up their price to a fair price. So the, the, the taxpayer was screwed in every single direction. We're talking about a lot of land mm. being acquired from a lot of different owners. This could become an absolute legal nightmare, couldn't it? Yeah, well, I mean, if the if the owner uh, challenges it in court, mm. then yeah, it could be it could be a very expensive exercise for the taxpayer. Either way, like they might have, you know, they might have paid a very high price for this land too, mm. and uh, you know that's going to be expensive for the taxpayer as well. I mean, ultimately, the taxpayer gets gets shafted either way, any way you look at it. But I, like, I don't see what the objective is here, and they mm. haven't been very clear and transparent about it. Um, if they're going to be spending large amounts of taxpayer money, the least they can do is at least put it through Parliament and, you know, let us examine what they're trying to do and make a decision on mm. it. It seems like this is all very secretive and uh, it's it's problematic that, you know, you find out about it from a Daily Mail article. <laughs> I know. Now, from from my perspective, compulsory acquisition is is a is a, pro a troubling thing. If it was for a hospital or for a necessary freeway or something like that, there's I think there's more of a case to be made. I'm still not comfortable with it, but there's more of a case to be made. But compulsory acquisition for the purpose of of parks seems to me to be an abuse of, of the reason why those uh, powers were given to the government in the first place. Final point here: advocates agree the traditional owners will have to be sufficiently resourced to look after the park. And once again, this is from that uh, Daily Mail article. Aren't we essentially just replacing the existing Parks Victoria with a whole bunch of new bodies? How, how does this fit with the existing? I mean, we've already got park management, don't we? We do, and it, it raises it raises another question: like, uh, 
why why are, why are we limiting the ability like all right let's say we do want to hand it over to the traditional owners corporation mm -hmm. um why don't they have the ability to you know make money out of it why does it need to be taxpayers fund funding mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. are the public going to still have access to this land or not we've seen what's happened out out in um out you know with the grampians and this mm -hmm. sort of thing and and other places uh, are people still going to have access? And if they don't have access, if taxpayers don't have access, why should they be paying for it? Look, it's one of these stories where there are far more questions than answers. And every time you look for an answer, you just come back with even more questions. We'll st certainly stay on top of this story here at the Aussie Wire. And uh, David Limbrick, MLC, we appreciate your time. We hope that if you do learn anything concrete or anything further on this story, we'll have you back on to bring that update to us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, coming off the back of the COVID era, there are lots of people who are trying to, I guess, hold people accountable is the best way to say it. Some people want to move on. They just want to say, hey, the COVID era is over. Let's get on with our lives. Some people want to live in fear. We're hearing from the government right now. Oh, there's new strains. There's new variants that are going around. We should all start wearing masks again. And then in the middle, there's this group of people that want to hold those in power accountable. And for what my opinion is worth, those are the people that I like to talk to. And one such person is a name you might be familiar with. It is Dr. Melissa McCann. And if you're familiar with her name, it's because she launched a class action. In fact, the world's first class action to hold people accountable, to hold those in power accountable for vaccine adverse events, adverse reactions. And yes, we're going to talk about it. This could be a segment that gets us cancelled off YouTube forever, but we're going to take that risk because this story is that important. I have Dr. McCann with me right now to bring us an update on the court case. Dr. McCann, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me on, Topher. Pleasure. Let's rewind to before COVID, just so that people understand, who is Dr. McCann? You're up in the Whitsundays, beautiful part of the world. You've got the Great Barrier Reef just off the coast there. I was in the Whitsundays, in fact, just in 2021. Stunning part of the world. Who was Dr. Melissa McCann pre-COVID? Um, yeah, well, pre-COVID, Topher, I was, um, I was and still am uh, just a lowly GP up working in a, in a rural, beautiful rural area. I've been here for about 12 years now, um, a mom, a wife, uh, I have a clinic in, in the Whitsundays and um, certainly never would have pictured myself in uh, doing something like this. Look, um, there's a lot of people who would say the same thing. The COVID era brought out the best and the worst in a lot of people. I would say it brought out the best in you. But let's, before we get to the court case, what was your initial response as a doctor? Obviously, all the experts, the government experts, the, 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 the medical advice, the people that we should be able to trust, all came out saying, this is terrible, this is awful, this is going to be a disaster. What was your initial reaction when you heard about COVID-19 in those very early days? Oh, to be honest, it was um, it was complete fear, and um, and I don't think any of us were immune to that. I don't think I've ever seen the medical profession as afraid. Some mm. of the first messaging actually that came out through social media channels and through the news was, um, you know, rates of deaths of up to nine percent in Italy were being quoted, mm -hmm. and there were these horrific stories of doctors who were catching COVID themselves, dying, bringing it home to their family members. So. Mm. Um, yeah, it was something that was, was, and, um, you know, and was for a very long time taken e extremely seriously. And, um, I guess there's so much that could be said about that. But in, in a nutshell, you know, we were modifying the way that our, our clinic operated. And mm. for a lot of the time, that meant phone consultations or, um, seeing people in, uh, you know, in the car park or having to sort of close the doors and have people ring up before they came in. So a lot of things that interfered with, I think, ideal care, certainly. Um, but at the time, thinking that that was the right thing to do to protect our communities, to protect um, our staff, our doctors. And so that was really, I guess, um, the first feelings. And then the next the next sort of impression and feeling was, thank you the vaccine, um, initially very enthusiastic about um, wanting to participate in that, initially mm. put in expressions of interest to provide the vaccine, you know, to my whole community. Mm. Uh, in the end, I only played an extremely limited role in that and I actually um, ceased to provide any vaccines um, once there were mandates. I just have an ethical um, problem with that. But, uh, you know, um, 
I certainly d- never expected to be in this position and really didn't start to have any concerns um, apart from the mandate issue, which I guess I have a conscientious objection to, but it was just more once I started to see adverse events, that was when my whole um, attitude, I guess, changed to all of this. Yeah, so you you now, obviously, you're leading a, a court case. We'll come to that in just a moment, but I'll, I want to dwell on your initial, or not initial, but your your progressive response as time went by. There was something that made you switch from, hey, yeah, this vaccine, let's, let's, this might be the answer, this might be the thing. Um, what was it that you saw? What was the data that you saw? You mentioned adverse reactions there. And again, we're going to get ourselves cancelled off YouTube here. Um, but, but, but what was it that you were seeing that made you change your, your approach and your attitude? Mm. Yeah, well, I guess I start really started to become concerned about uh, concerned about adverse events in about October. So it was early October when um, the mandates were which, first which announced. Year? This is two thousand twenty one. Twenty one. Sorry, 21, end of yeah. twenty one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so that was where I guess vaccine uptake in my area really started to pick up, mm-hmm. and. Um, and it was coincident in timing with that. So, in other words, soon after that, that people were coming in and having um, literally everything from chest pain to miscarriages, several strokes, wow. um, blood clots, and it was just saying over and over again, like, um, could this have something to do with the vaccine? I had it three days ago. Or, um, I had it a week ago. And, sure. you know, you might hear that once or twice and think, possibly, you know, just sort of make a mental note of it. We better make mm. sure a report's been made, etc. And then that happens, you know, a few more times and you think, wait a minute, this cannot be, statistically, this is impossible. I'm in yeah. a small rural community. Yeah. How on earth can there be multiple people with myocarditis? It's not possible. It's extraordinary times and the data, I mean, you look at the work of people like Ed Dowd over in the US as he's just analysing data worldwide relentlessly. Uh, the, the work of, of uh, people like uh, Naomi Wolf as she's analysing the Pfizer papers. I mean, it's, it's quite a, an extraordinary time. But coming to your court case, there is a difference between a doctor who says there's something wrong here and a doctor who says, I'm going to put my name down and be the be Johnny on the spot. I'm going to I'm going to be the one uh, responsible for a class action court case. What was it that brought you to the point that you were really willing, if I can use a crude expression, to put your balls on the line over this court case? What brought you to that point? Um, I mean, that was that was a slow progression. That mm. probably really started with my observations, and then. Um, Another couple of colleagues coming up to me and um, just saying, look, should we perhaps consider a practice audit that they had also seen several cases of myocarditis? Mm. And so, and of course, being mindful the whole time at this point in 21, I mean, it was in it was in March of 21 that we had the statement from APRA that was very clear. Yes. And I've got to say, that was listened to. I mean, APRA has a real history of, um, I guess coming down really strongly on doctors, and so this wasn't something that everyone just sort of, oh, okay, we sure. better be careful what we say, but but we can say what we want to each other. That's just not the case because with APRA, there's um, something called mandatory reporting, which means that mm. if a colleague, um, if a colleague witnesses another health professional doing something that's outside of the code, that person has to report that colleague. Mm. Now. So then that means that everyone is extremely careful about what they say in case another um, health professional, you know, misinterprets that or, or thinks that they maybe have to make a report or something wow. like that. So it, it there is a wow. um, absolutely a strong dampener on um, free conversation about what everyone was seeing. But I was still hearing enough behind closed doors and what I was seeing from patients that I just felt so strongly that something had to be done. And I felt... I guess I felt like I was in a position to do that, like mm. um, just in terms of, you know, where I was in my career, where I was in my family that I thought, you know what, if, uh, whatever it takes, this is in, unjust. And also it's only because of my patients that I am in a position that I'm in. I mean, I, I came, yeah, but came from nothing really. I was the first yeah. person in my family to finish high school, let alone go to uni. And I thought wow. the only reason that I'm even in a position of, you know, working in a practice and having a practice and is my patients. And so that's what matters. That has to be my first concern. And if that means risking, that if that means risk to my career, I just felt that actually that that was wrong anyway. And I'd rather 
go through that process and challenge that with APRA, which uh, which I'm actually having to do now, mm. um, because I felt that what I was doing was in every way consistent with the code of conduct. So that was where, where my thinking was when I started it. Mm. And then where that actual process of starting it was seeing all of these patients with injuries um, having all these roadblocks to compensation. So roadblocks through work cover, roadblocks through the compensation scheme. And so I just came to the opinion that I thought, um, you know, actually that the TGA had a lot of responsibility here. And so then I went through the next steps, which is um, engaging a barrister to provide an opinion on the, um, you know, arguability of a case like that. And then, and then working with the legal team to um, actually put together the class action. Well, Dr. McCann, there is a massive difference between people who say someone should do something, which you've discussed in detail now. I mean, you were looking at it going, there's something wrong here. There's a difference between someone who says someone should do something versus someone who says, I'm going to do something. And I I applaud you for being the latter, the person who says, you know what, I'm going to do something. The court case that you're running, for those that maybe have never come across it, they've never heard your name, they don't know anything about the case, what is the court case? And, And what if you were to be successful, what what are the implications? What are you trying to achieve here? Mm. Um, so it's a federal class action. So that mm. means it covers everyone in Australia who's in the class. And the class in this case is everyone with a um, vaccine injury. Right. And what the class action is seeking, it, it, and yeah, what it's seeking is um, compensation for the injury, so um, medical expenses and um, economic and non-economic losses, essentially. And it's against the TGA. So the, so the TGA, and I should say more specifically, um, so John Skerritt, as the head of the, former head of the TGA, of course, um, Brendan Murphy, former head of the health department, mm-hmm. um, uh, Paul Kelly, uh, chief uh, chief medical officer, wow. and okay. uh, Greg Hunt, the former health minister. Wow. So, um, that's who it's against, and um, what it alleges is that the actions of of those parties who had responsibility over approving the vaccines, um, ensuring that they were safe for the Australian public, and um, and then monitoring the the vaccines for adverse events. Mm. That what it alleges is that their actions in all of those processes um, was negligent or misfeasant, and. Um, and that that's led to the to the damages or the injuries sure. of the class. So what's what's the timeline here? Obviously, you know, it's been some time since this class action began. Some people, you know, they want instant gratification. They think it's a Hollywood movie. We should be able to watch for 90 minutes and see the happy ending. What's the reality of the timelines of what you're working on? Um, well, they say most class actions run somewhere between, say, one and four years. So right. we're almost one year down. I don't know. It's hard to say if this one would take as long as, as four years. I think we'll certainly see some um, more progress, I would think, next year. So mm-hmm. so this this year, a lot of it has been um, sort of negotiating, I guess, in a way between the parties where they, um, they can request extra information on the claim sure. and then into early next year. And, and a lot of this is on the federal court uh, website under the class actions that um, some of the next steps that the other side can take and, and they have foreshadowed um, and that's that's on the website that they may take these actions such mm. as a application to strike it out or for a summary judgment or sure. for a, um, to a cost security, things like that. So those are the things that it will be happening over the next sort of few months and then depending on the outcome of all of that as to how what the next steps might be with it. And it is, I mean, I feel extremely impatient with it in a way I feel I feel wo- so worried for all these people because mm. you can imagine as this process has gone along there's um well you know I won't say exactly how many but let's just say well into the well well over a thousand yeah um who've sent in like their stories their medical information and and some of these people are just so unwell you yeah. just think I just wish this was over today and these people could get the care that they need to get the compensation they need so that um because right now is when they need it but um yeah. but you know they're an amazing group and and i've i've heard them say you know these things even them sort of reassuring these things take time and basically let let it all stack up because yeah. in fact the longer it's taking 
there's actually an increasing body of evidence that will support this claim. So um, sure. I guess that's the positive side of it taking this time. Well, look, not that my situation is, is equivalent. I have not been injured in the same way that many of your uh, the people in your class action have been, but it took two years and, and literally just the other morning the Victoria Police withdrew their criminal incitement charges against me. That took them over two years to do on something as simple as criminal incitement charges. So something like your case, if it's only had a year to run so far, unfortunately, there's probably quite a long time to run. Uh, I say that with no pleasure. I mean, justice delayed is justice denied. That's a that's a, a saying. It's a truism, but it's it's true for a reason. If someone wanted to support you and to help you in that court case, where would they find more information? Where would they find you? Where could they support you? Mm. Well, the class action website is www.covidvaxclassaction.com.au. Mm -hmm. That's got information on the action. It's got a link to join. So the, the, the action is still open and people are joining every day. Mm. So, um, yeah, there's just uh, links and things like that is on that page. Mm. There is a link on that page to our crowdfunding platform, um, but that can also be found at no more silence AU, no more silence Australia.com. Um, and that's so the action is being run. Um, purely on donations um, with with no person should it, should it be lucky enough to win um, no person who's uh, financially benefiting or t or taking any yeah. you know percentage from this this whole matter is being run for the injured so that that does mean that it runs on donations so if anyone can support it that's amazing mm. well this is one of the incredible things that you don't trumpet Dr McCann but I'm going to trumpet on your behalf uh, if there were litigation funders involved in this they would take a huge chunk of whatever payment came out of the other end of it. You're not doing that. You, you've actually put yourself at risk and you're not standing to gain anything out of this uh, this financially. So I, I've just got massive respect for what you're doing. I, I do hope that you'll keep us posted. Anytime there's an update, please, you, there's an open invitation for you to come back on the Aussie Wire News. Give us an update. Uh, but in the interim, Dr. Melissa McCann, thank you so much for coming on the Aussie Wire. Thank you so much, Topher. Well, you may have noticed that there's a cost of living crisis. I know, who knew? Apparently, the cost of living has gone up. Not that you'd know it. I mean, you fill up a shopping cart and then you just have to sell a kidney or two just to be able to afford to eat for the week. But we're being told that that's kind of expected. It's kind of normal. Oh, no, it's just you whinging. We're being told all sorts of different things by all sorts of different people. And we're also being offered very different solutions by different people. In fact, the Albanese government, before they were elected, promised us that they were going to give us handouts to help us afford the cost of energy, the cost of electricity, if my memory serves me correctly. And it may not, but if my memory serves me correctly, I think it was $230 to help us afford electricity. Well, on my my current electricity rate, that will pay for about three weeks, and that's it. Something is very, very wrong, and here at the Aussie Wire, we're trying to figure out why and what. What's gone wrong that has caused our cost of living to go this crazy, and more importantly, how do we fix it? One of the interesting things in this topic is that tax cuts have been proposed for some time. We're due to have stage three tax cuts and in fact stage four tax cuts. There's two more tax cuts already slated to happen. But how could you possibly justify cutting taxes at a time like this? Well, to try and answer that question, I've brought on an economist. Now, please don't tune out. No, no, no. Hang on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Just before you reach for the button, an economist is not inherently boring, although I will admit the one I've got on is maybe not top shelf, but he's not too bad either. And it's John Humphreys from the Australian Taxpayers Alliance. John, you're a friend of the show. Thank you for coming back on. Yeah, thank you for that wonderful introduction, Tom. Look, I couldn't miss the opportunity to give you a bit of a hard time. But it is a funny thing, don't you think, to be talking about tax cuts at a time when we are, without question, in a cost of living crisis. Why are we even having this conversation? What possible good could come from tax cuts? Broad question. Look, there's a, a bunch to what you were saying in that introduction, uh, and some of it is going in different directions. One of the issues is we've got runaway prices. Mm. And the other issue is wages are stubbornly not keeping pace. We've had real wage declines for the last couple of years. Sure. We are in a per capita recession already. The economy is stagnating, but we have runaway prices. Mm. And we've got two different solutions for, for both of those. For, for prices, what we need is to fix the monetary policy. The government has been creating too much money 
for too long. I think we've talked about that previously. My opinion sure. hasn't changed. But the other side of that topic is how do you kickstart that wages growth again? And the main ways, the, the, the only way to kickstart wages growth is to improve productivity. And the main ways you can improve productivity is to reduce taxes and reduce regulation. And the issue that we've currently got on the table is the, the need for tax cuts. The currently stage three tax cuts are scheduled to come in next year. Mm. Uh, there are no stage four tax cuts yet scheduled, although I am in the process of strongly campaigning and arguing <laughs> that we need to take a step forward. Sure. Because we've got, as I'm sure you've seen, we've had some calls from the mainstream media and the, and the green left element of politics saying that stage three tax cuts were already too much tax cuts. Yeah. And my argument is actually stage three was a great step in the right direction. And kudos, I think it was the best piece of reform in 20 years, but it's only the first step. We've got, if I may continue the rant a little bit, <laughs> okay, you've, we've discussed before the issue of bracket creep and the sure. issue of bracket creep. So we have a progressive income tax system. Inflation pushes you into higher tax brackets over time, mm. which means you're paying a higher, higher average amount of tax, even if your real income isn't going up. Sure. Because inflation is just pushing into higher tax brackets. And that is a bonanza for the government. Mm. The government's revenue has been going up by a secret tax increase of about $10 billion every year. Billion. That's $10,000 mm. million dollars every year of a secret tax increase. Mm. Now, here's a little insight. Stage three tax cuts... They're going to actually reduce revenue by about ten billion dollars. Yeah, right. But that's for one year. So stage three compensates us for one year of bracket creep. Right. We need to be compensated for all the other years of bracket creep. We need to go further. It's a good start. It's not enough, and that's why I'm saying we need to start talking about stage four and not wind back stage three. Okay, let me stop you there though, because I've been listening to Q and A, and they have told me in no uncertain terms that if we if we actually go through with stage three tax cuts, then that's going to stop us from giving government handouts to help people deal with the cost of living. How do we, I mean, people are looking to the government right now to solve this cost of living crisis. Surely the government needs the tax revenue to give the handouts. Yeah, well, it's uh, very, very well argued. Look, the cost of living crisis is a monetary phenomenon. It, it is caused by the fact that we have inflation. And you cannot fix it unless you get inflation under control. And we absolutely need to get inflation under control. Uh, and that means the government needs to stop creating so much additional money, which is primarily done through the Reserve Bank. Look, that is an important reform point. Uh, but you're not going to fix the cost of living crisis by handing out a few more trinkets from year to year. Right. That's it's not going to particularly make it worse or better. It's just going to be doing fiddling while Rome, Rome burns. Mm. Right? You need to fix inflation with good monetary policy. In the meantime, you need to kickstart the actual economy. And that's where you need the reform, the deregulation. And here what we're talking about is the tax cuts, meaningful tax cuts that actually improve incentives. I want to I just before gave a compliment to the uh, the Liberal government for stage three tax cuts. I want to now couch it because you know how uncomfortable I am giving too many compliments. <laughs> stage three, as you can see, it implies there was already a stage one and a stage two. Sure. And stage one and stage two meant some people got to keep more of their own money. And that's great. I, I'm all for that. But it didn't really reform the economic system. It didn't improve incentives. Right. Stage three is the only part of their tax reform agenda that improves the incentives and would actually kickstart the economy. Can I give you one okay. more stat? I know a lot of numbers thrown around here. Sure. I said before that stage three is going to mean that the government has $10 billion less revenue, compensate us for one year of bracket creep. Mm -hmm. It will also inject $30 billion into the private economy. So that's the benefit cost analysis we've got here. The government pretends that it's just redistribution. They pretend that the benefit on one side is just equal to the cost on the other, and you're just cha arguing about who gets it. But this tax cut, it kickstarts the economy so that the, the government loses $10 billion, but the private sector gets $30 billion. And that's a deal worth making. You're going to have to you're going to have to slow down a little bit. Your university education and years as an economist are showing. When you talk about incentives... How could how could government tax policy change incentives, and why why does that matter? What's what is this incentive business that you're talking about? I love that you asked uh, because your perhaps genuine curiosity asks a question that the government's own numbers pretends they don't know. Look, mm. incentives. If the price of something goes up, you're less likely to buy it. Uh, this is okay. we all understand incentives everywhere else in our life, but it's true everywhere, right? So if if the benefit from hiring a tax accountant to hide your income so that you pay less tax is high enough, mm. you will hire that tax accountant. Sure. 
I'll if, pay twenty thousand dollars if I can save a hundred thousand dollars tax. Yep. The benefit of working overtime is so low that you don't get to pocket the money. You won't work overtime. At right. one point in history, in the UK, the marginal tax rate was ninety-five <laughs> percent. The Beatles famously wrote a song about it called "Tax Man." Uh, look, <laughs> there are cases in Australia where the effective marginal tax rate is a hundred percent. Wow! In my family, if we went from one hundred and five thousand family income up to one hundred and six, we would lose five thousand dollars. <laughs> but anyway, that, that's a topic for another day. That this is some crazy quirks of wow. the tax system. The point is. The, I'll come back and talk to you about that one at some yeah, stage. Yeah, another that's time. Crazy. Absolutely. But the point is, if you, if you change the incentives, if you change how much money you get to keep, people certainly change their behavior. This isn't just a theoretical point. It's been studied in depth all around the world for the last 30 years very closely. It's, it's captured in one statistic called the elasticity of taxable income. And for those skeptics at home, not, mm -hmm. not convinced about what I'm saying, just Google that one term and you'll find far more than you'd ever want to read in a normal <laughs> lifetime. Uh, and... It's not zero. The yeah. fact is people change their behavior. If you change tax rates, people do change their behavior. And if you don't factor that in, we have an entirely dishonest tax conversation. So if I can try and reflect back to you what I think you're saying to make sure that I, that I understand it, what you're suggesting to me is that these proposed tax three, uh, sorry, stage three tax cuts, if they go through, will change the incentives enough that people will then change their behaviour enough that it will be a net benefit to Australia? Well, unambiguously. There's, there's no doubt that it's going to be a benefit. The only question remaining is whether you think $30 billion in the private sector mm. is more or less valuable than $10 billion to politicians. Now, well, it could be that you think politicians are so ingenious <laughs> that they are going to spend that $10 billion you know, three times better than the private sector could. And if that's your argument, fine, at least you're being honest about what your argument is. I disagree with you. <laughs> uh, I, I think that the $30 billion in the private sector is definitely going to be better for the country. It's going to drive the economic growth you need to actually get wages going, mm. uh, which is part of the whole problem we have today. We're in stagnation. We're in a per capita recession. Something Look, has to drive us forward. I'm a libertarian. I'm not going to defend government spending and government revenue at any level uh, for any reason. But look, I, I, I thank you for helping us to try and wrap our heads around this. So what you're saying is that contrary to Q&A, stage three uh, tax cuts should proceed. And in fact, they don't go nearly far enough if, I'm, if I've understood your argument correctly. Now, there's one thing I want to bring up here. There, there's, a, there's a graph here that's shows, I guess, a divergence between what the government is spending and what the economic growth is. Now, this, you mentioned to me before we started recording, this is very important to you. What is what is this telling us? Yeah, well, I, I might not have explained it right. There's no spending on this graph. This graph shows the bottom line there, the orange line shows what revenue should have done revenue. if the government okay. wasn't growing. So revenue should grow naturally over time anyway because the population is increasing. Okay. Right? So that, that's an understandable reason for revenue growth. And there is inflation. Right? Okay. So if you factor in inflation and population growth, you would expect to see revenue trending up. Mm -hmm. And that's what that orange line shows. It shows revenue trending up if the government wasn't changing in size. What the blue line shows is reality. And as you can see, Revenue has gone up significantly more than it would have in a status right. quo scenario. Those lines are diverging significantly. They're diverging partly because of bracket creep. But part of that is explained by that $10 billion every year adding up and getting bigger and bigger over time. Sure. Can I just tell you that the difference between those two lines after the last, this is since the year 2000, that graph. Mm. So since the year 2000, the difference is $1.5 trillion. We were talking before about billions, so we've just jumped up an alien. One point five <laughs> trillion of of extra revenue the government has taken off us over and above what they would have under a status quo scenario. So we've got a runaway revenue problem. Uh, the problem is not uh, how can the government spend more. They're already spending more than they're taxing, wow. and they're already taxing more than can be justified. We need to get this tax rate under control. We need another round of tax cuts. Well, that is extraordinary. And this graph alone, I think, makes the case for you, given that that bottom line is already adjusted for both inflation and population. Uh, that top line strikes me as completely unjustifiable. Well, I wish you all the best in your crusade in favour of stage three tax cuts. And let's hope that we get, sta we get to stage 20 sometime soon. Thank you, uh, John Humphreys, for uh, joining us here on the Aussie Wire. Thank you, Tofa. 
Thank you for watching the Aussie Wire News. We release new episodes of the news every Tuesday and Thursday at 4 p.m. You can catch up on past episodes and find all of our blogs at theaussiewire.com. Be sure to sign up for the Aussie Wire email list and consider becoming an insider. An insider is a financial supporter of the Aussie Wire, and insiders get exclusive content including dozens of interviews from the ARC conference, and soon insiders will also receive my interview with former Deputy Prime Minister John Anderson as well. Plus, insiders get discounts, including a 50% discount off my book, Good People Break Bad Laws, and they get giveaways. We've given away thousands of dollars worth of merch and event tickets this year already. You'll find the link to become an insider in the description of this video. Thank you for watching. I'm Topher Field. And this is the Aussie Wire.